are coming and that's okay. So yeah, we can start. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, welcome back uh, to our first session uh, here after the break. Um, uh, I want to introduce the speakers first. My name is uh, Ula Berg. Uh, I work at Rutgers University in New Jersey in the United States. Um, and this session uh, has three papers uh, and four authors. Uh, the first is Jose um, Brandariz, who is an associate professor of criminal law and criminology at the University of Coruña, Spain. He's also an associate editor of the European Journal of Criminology and a former member of the executive board of the European Society of Criminology. And the title of his paper today is Expanding the Analytical Gaze on the Penal Power, Immigration Detention and Deportation Practices. Then we have a paper by Diego Bosa and Devika Perez uh, from the University of Cadiz. Uh, and Diego Bosa is a lecturer of criminal law and criminology at the University of Cadiz. And Devika Perez is a PhD student of criminal law at the same university. And the title of their paper is uh, Cates, New Migrant Detention Centers in Spain. And then finally, we have an intervention from Cristina Fernandez Besa, who is a Juan de la Sierva postdoctoral fellow at ICRIM, the universe, at the University of Coruña. Um, and she was previously affiliated with the University of Barcelona, where she got her PhD in law and political science. Uh, the title of her paper today is Transformation of Immigration detention in Spain. Um, I should say that all presenters will have 20 minutes and I will enforce those 20 minutes strictly to leave us time for a discussion afterwards. Um, and if people have uh, questions throughout, you can put them in the chat uh, and we will collect them uh, at the end for um, the discussion. So without further ado, uh, Jose Brandariz, uh, adelante. Thank you, Ola. I'm you know, amazed about various things, and one of them is your Spanish pronunciation, which is really <laughs> amazing. Yeah, that's intriguing. Uh, okay, so I, I got a PowerPoint here that I want to share with you. Just let me know whether you can see it. I hope you can. Right, okay, so um, yeah. So the emerging significance of migration enforcement policies and practices is markedly changing the punitive field. In line with this shift, a compelling debate on the need to broaden the analytical perspective on the penal power has gained traction in academic environments in recent years. This burgeoning literature argues that a scholarly notions of penality and punitiveness cannot be dependent on the strict legal conceptions of the phenomena under study. Consequently, some authors have crafted notions that are wider and less legally determined than punishment, such as what Catherine Beckett and Naomi Murakawa have called the shadow carceral state. Invariably, these contributions mention immigration enforcement as one of the critical phenomena falling under the radar of mainstream accounts on penality. And the border criminology literature has particularly elaborated this claim. More precisely, this literature has recently inspired academic debates on punitiveness, its meaning and its indicators. Specific, uh, specifically, border criminology scholars have convincingly argued that migration enforcement measures, namely detention and deportation, should be taken into consideration in assessing penality and punitiveness. Consequently, this body of scholarship regards incarceration rates as an incomplete and misleading indicator of the severity of a given criminal justice system. In short, the border criminology literature makes a significant contribution to challenge mainstream accounts on punitiveness. However, this body of scholarship 
risks over emphasizing certain changes triggered by the emergence of border penalty arrangements. And this paper aims to spotlight one specific dimension of these border criminology debates by focusing on migration enforcement practices in Europe. Okay, so border criminology authors and other authors as well have frequently claimed that immigration enforcement policies have gained traction in recent decades, leading to a significant expansion of migration control practices, namely detention and deportation. So this claim is indisputably valid from a long-term perspective. That was mentioned by Alison Mounts some minutes ago. Some minor exceptions aside, such as the Ellis Island and the Angel, sorry, Angel Island custodial facilities in the early 20th century United States, no global North jurisdiction had a stable and relatively wide ranging immigration detention state until some decades ago. And as far as deportation practices are concerned, their wide scale enforcement is also a relatively recent phenomenon. However, the conclusion that the immigration enforcement system has been constantly expanding in the recent past is less tenable as soon as a short term perspective is adopted. To begin with, European prison systems confine remarkable numbers of non-citizens. That, that's an European thing. This is not happening in the United States, and this is not happening, as far as I know, elsewhere in America. So this is a very European thing. European prison systems confine remarkable numbers of non-citizens. The percentage of foreign national prisoners has soared over the last 20 years in many European countries, and you get you got some examples there in the slide. By contrast, in some jurisdictions, the percentage of this segment of the prison population has either remained stable, for instance, in Belgium, France, Hungary, the Netherlands, and Switzerland, or declined in the Czech Republic, Poland, Portugal, Spain, and Sweden in the recent past. What is more, when the relative size of the foreign residing population is considered the alleged increasing impact of the prison system on non-citizen groups cannot be confirmed. In fact, in the vast majority of European nations, foreign prison population rates have conspicuously declined over the last 10 to 20 years. This point might suggest that immigration enforcement measures are compensating the declining role, this declining role of the prison system in managing unwanted foreign populations. Still, official data do not confirm this hypothesis. Global detention project data show that immigration detention populations significantly escalated in various European jurisdictions such as Bulgaria, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Luxembourg, and Sweden from the late 2000s to the late 2010s. Oh, sorry. Yeah. However, the number of detainees notably shrank in the Czech Republic, Germany, Ireland, Italy, the Netherlands, Slovakia, Spain, and Switzerland over the same period. And moreover, while detention rates have been extremely high in several, mainly Eastern jurisdictions, such as Bulgaria, Croatia, France, Greece, Hungary, and Slovenia, France, and Greece, obviously are not Eastern jurisdictions, are exceptions here. In recent years, the Czech Republic, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Luxembourg, Spain, and Switzerland have had detention rates lower than 200 detainees per 100,000 residing non-citizens over the same period. Deportation data add a new layer of complexity to this puzzling continental scenario. Despite an evident surge in deportations in 2015 and 2016, especially in Poland and Germany, 
The number of removals carried out by EU member states largely declined from 2008 to 2019, let alone 2020. Removals soared in Bulgaria, Denmark, Finland, Germany, Poland, the three Baltic nations, and apparently Norway over the last 12 years. By contrast, marked downward trends characterize deportation changes in other nations, including Cyprus, Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Romania, and Spain. And in this regard, the UK is a particularly relevant case, for it arguably has the most comprehensive deportation machine both in terms of scope and effectiveness, the most comprehensive deportation machine of all European nations. In Britain, deportations dwindled by 37.6% from the late 20, uh, 2000, sorry, to the late 2010s. And compounding this picture even further, some European jurisdictions and examples here are essentially Belgium, France, essentially, but not exclusively, Belgium, France, Greece, Italy, the Netherlands, and Spain have long had and still have very low enforcement rates. That is, they only enforce less than one out of three issued removal orders. In addition, in considering population changes, one can ascertain that in most European countries, including top deporting jurisdictions such as France, Greece, Poland, Spain, and the UK, deportation rates were lower in 2019 than in the late 2000s. In sum, and in short, the available data show that although immigration enforcement practices are on the rise in numerous, in numerous jurisdictions, this is not a global phenomenon, or at least it is not a continental phenomenon in the European case. On the contrary, those official data lay bared and unstable in changing border penalty landscape. The only widespread pattern that seems to emerge from the analyzed official data is that certain European regions witnessed a surge in immigration enforcement practices like Southern Europe in the 2000s and Eastern Europe in the mid to late 2010s when human mobility phenomena began to have a significant impact on them. And subsequently, these practices have tended to level off and eventually decline. Moving to the conclusion, <clears throat> border criminology debates are still emerging. In fact, this academic field has been only focused on a handful of global north jurisdictions so far. Sometimes, and I wanna underline this, sometimes, only sometimes, this narrow lens has led the border criminology literature to assume that migration enforcement arrangements implemented in certain core countries are also pivotal elsewhere. As this paper has attempted to highlight, that is not the case. On the contrary, the immigration enforcement scenario is as volatile as it is diverse, both in the global north and as well. This diversity is somehow intriguing in the European case. In contrast to other global regions, Schengen land jurisdictions share migration enforcement agencies such as Frontex, wide-ranging immigration policy agendas such as the new Pact on Migration and Asylum passed in September 2010, and migration control legislation such as the Return Directive. And despite this ambitious harmonization efforts, there is no continent-wide model of migration enforcement. As Katia Franco recently stated, there are, in practice, numerous national variations of border penalty and crime immigration control. In fact, certain European countries, such as Bulgaria, France, and Portugal, use detention measures widely and deportation measures much more sparingly. 
By contrast, jurisdictions such as Cyprus, Finland, Germany, Lithuania, the Netherlands, Poland, Romania, and Slovakia have relatively tiny immigration detention systems and much wider ranging deportation systems. This analysis leads to two main conclusions. Given the noteworthy diversity of migration enforcement policies across Europe and elsewhere, cross-national explorations are vital to further develop border criminologies research agenda. In addition, this diversity may be leveraged for advocacy purposes. The varied immigration enforcement landscape provides clues to ambition and promote social justice and racial justice agendas in the field of border control. The impact of the pandemic on immigration detention, and this is the, the last point of my, of my presentation, the impact of the pandemic on immigration detention makes up a suitable manifestation of the political potential of migration enforcement diversity. In many European countries, as you probably know, public health measures hardly altered detention practices. In the stark contrast, the anti-coronavirus policies led to release wide contingents of detained non-citizens in various Western European countries, such as Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and the UK. And even to close down all detention facilities in Spain in the spring and summer 2020. So my conclusion is even in countries in which migrants' rights were largely overlooked in preventing the pandemic inside custodial facilities, the progressive measures adopted in those Western European countries in the first wave of the pandemic are a powerful asset to be mobilized for detention abolition purposes. Thank you. I stick to the time, I think. Ular, you are muted. Oops. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jose. You definitely stick to the time. You even had four minutes left. So now we have a little added time uh, to our discussion at the end. I appreciate it. The next presentation is by Diego Bosa Martinez and Devika Perez Medina from the University of Cadiz. Adelante. Uh, yes, you can hear me, yes? Correct? Yes. Okay, you. thank you. Hello, uh, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, my name is Devika Perez. Um, I'm here with my partner, Diego Bozo Martinez. In first place, we want to thank to the organization for inviting us. Uh, we're going to talk about CATES, or short-term assistance centers, and internment centers for foreign nationals in Spain. Uh, under Pedro Sánchez leadership, the Spanish government has modified migration management in Spain, essentially in relation to arrivals and recep receptions. A key instrument has been in the introduction of short-term assistance centers, which are called CATES. This new, this, this new instrument has helped the Spanish government to improve its immigration policies, although not in, a f in, in the favorable way for the migrants. That's what is a cut. Although some of, the, although some of these centers functioned as cut since 2017, it was not until 2018 that this concept began to be used. Due to the absence of a specific legislation, a definition of the CATES must therefore be sown from other source, other source. One of these sources is the definition given by the Minister of the Interior, Grande Marlaska, at 2018. That was, it is a police station, but one of 
but one of that provide many of the services they need, including interpreters, health cares for those not eating it of hospitalization. That is a cate. People never stay there for more than 72 hours stipulate. It is not a CIE or a inter or internment center. Sorry. Other source uh, is the definition given in the resolution of the Secretary of State for Security, who said, the intended purpose of these facilities is to con conduct initial identification procedures, procedures sorry, and background checks with a maximum stay of 22 hours for some consent refer referral to CS or NGO. I know this definition may sound familiar, they are similar to the function of the famous hotspot. The reality is, although cates are not recognized at, at, as hotspots, they can be classified as them for or by their nature. Reviewing this defi these definitions, does it co uh, this coincide with the reality? It is true that it's not as here but they are not receiving adequate assistance of, and the conditions are very poor. In many cases, adequate health care has not been re received for, for the foreign children. Children have been detained and the site of the cells is not legal. The ambiguity of the concept helps these to be allowed without an adequate sanction. The cates are not considered to be either detention center or police station. Although it is true that the maximum period of 22 hours, the situation of the pandemics is an excuse to retain them for longer time. Nowadays, there are five cates in Spanish territory, Algeciras, Malaga, Almería, Motril, and the last one which was open at 2020 in Canary Island. We ask for recent fewers, but they have given them to us and also they they need the access to the nationality of the people detained in the cates. Um, they have not allowed us to access more data that, than does colleagues in this table. The data provided mm -hmm. does not even have a breakdown by nationality. Now, I want to pass the word to my partner Diego to continue this, this position. Uh, well, I uh, thank you, Devika. I, I take the floor to, to continue the presentation, talking about the the, the situation of of the five uh, cats that that Devika mentioned. Uh, well, the the first mm, the the inauguration of this facility began began with the cat in San Roque, known as Crinavis, which opened in on the second of August of uh, two thousand eighteen and received more than mm, 2,000 uh, 2, and a half uh, thousand people in its first six weeks of operation. Uh, in parallel with the opening of the Kinabi Center, the Motril, um, the Motril facility was also uh, remodeled. In it, initially, it was called a Center for Initial Assistance and Detention of Foreign Nationals. But uh, when it was uh, and it was not until August 2018, after the San Roque Cate had opened, that the Motril Center then went remodeling again with the help of military emergency unit and was called Cate. This is very important because the 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 word the as as Devika explained the the lack of regulation it's linked with the uh, with the uh, different uh, with the different use of the of the term. Uh, the, the figure, the, the institution, more or less existed before in, in Motril or in Almeria, but it wasn't called CATES. Uh, but when the, the Criminal Center was, was opened in, in 2018, the, uh, the government uh, started to use this, this term. And there is very important the, the concept of, of ambiguity uh, because they, uh, they didn't recognize that Cates um, as detention centers. This uh, this is used to um, justify some kind of uh, violation, some kind of restriction of of rights of for migrants, 
because the, these centers, for example, Malaga Center, uh, Malaga Cate, uh, in, didn't respect the, the, the conditions, the, the regulation about detention centers. For example, the, uh, the distance of, for, for the people and the, uh, the, the length of the, of the rooms. So it's, it's very important because uh, in this also, one of the main points as, as we can so we can see in the in the table uh, that was that minors was also detained in the in the in the cates. Well, this this four first cates was at the at the south coast of of Spain. Uh, in fact, uh, it was being said that there was a project to open a new cat in Cartagena at the east coast. However, the, that cate is only on paper, but on November 2020, Spanish government opened a new cate in the Canary Island. It was the cate of Barranco Seco with a capacity for nine, 950 people. Uh, Barranco Seco was the answer to the growth of the arrivals at the Canary Island during 2020. According to APDHA in 2019, uh, 2000, uh, 2000 uh, five, uh, 700 people arrived at Canary Island, whereas there were 20,000 arrivals in 2020, representing a growth of 756%. Migrants at the very beginning were held in the port of Arguineguin, a small Canary village, and later in a chamb in the same city. The precarious condition and the violation of migrants' rights were denounced by the NGOs, the media, and the ombudsman, the Spanish ombudsman. Barranco Seco was also highly criticized because of its poor conditions and the violation of the migrants' rights. The Spanish ombudsman denounced that the condition of the Cato of Barranco Seco were inadequate uh, and recognized that some migrants had been detained more than 72 hours, the legal maximum. It was very linked to the, uh, sit to the um, pandemic situation, to the COVID, because as, as I said before, uh, the, the, the ambiguous um, understanding of the government of these centers help them to uh, not um, not to respect this limit and to to keep migrants there more than 72 hours because of uh, near contacts to a person with the, with the covid with the covid uh, barranco seco was an urgent response to a difficult situation and we think its role in the management of the migration in Spain in general, in the Canary Island in particular, is a little bit different from the rest of the cadets. However, we haven't enough elements, enough time, because it's from the, from the, the end of 2020, to analyze uh, this role. At this point, we can pass to, to the other, the, 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 the main point of, of, our, uh, of uh, our presentation, it was the role of the CATES in the Spanish migratory system. We can highlight that they have improved the efficiency of the CIES. Uh, the inclusion of CATES in the system for managing irregular arrival of migrants and therefore in the deportation process has significantly influenced the operation of the CIES, leading to an increase in the rate of returns. In 2016, only 29% of the people interned in, in, in fees were deported, and only 37% in 2017. However, in 2018 and 2019, this percentage rose to 58, 58%, as shown in figure, uh, in figure two. Uh, the total figures also evidence an increase since uh, 2,200 2, people uh, were deported in, two, in 2016 and 3,700 people were deported in 2019. So it was an increase in the percentage and in the, uh, in the whole um, percent, um, in the whole figure. How have they get that? The main the, 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 the CATES allowed, allows the government to avoid sub-Saharan people going into the fees. This figure, the figure one, shows how the number of sub-Saharan people interning in CS 
fell dramatically in 2018, while the number of North Africans rose. Thus, in 2016, 55% of people interned in CS were of Sub-Saharan origin. 20% were Algerian and 12 Moroccan. If we go to uh, 2018, when the cuts started to uh, uh, started, uh, we can see that uh, Moroccan internet rose to 35% and Algerian internet to 432. In consequence, 67 of people interning in ASEA in 2018 came from one of the countries in the Maghreb. We, with, with these countries, there is more, is, there is easier the deportation. So it's the, the reason to the increase of the percentage of deportation from the CS. Also in 2019, 71% uh, of people in turn in CA were from one of these two countries. In short, the inclusion of CATES in the migration management system has led to an increase in the number of people from Morocco and Algeria who are interned and increasing internally repatriation rates. This has generated a differential one might, might say discriminatory system, which prioritizes the repatriation of Moroccan nationals while open new routes for sub-Saharan people. They have this, we can, we can see in the, in, the, in the figures, we can see the, um, the process for the uh, migrants from Maghreb, migrants from Morocco and from Algeria come to the police extension, then to the CA and there, and there then to the they have deport they they are deported to Morocco to Algeria and in when we talk about uh, sub-Saharan they went to the Cate and then they went to the CIE in a less um, average and went to a new system a new system uh, a new institution called CAID. what the Spanish government created this new institution, the Assistant Emergency and Referral Centres, Centros de Atención, Emergencia y Deriv Derivación, CAED in Spanish initials. It should be noted that, that these centres were initially called short-term reception and assistance centres. And there are not, there, there are one um, similarity, the, the lack of any legal, legal framework, as the CATES, they have no uh, legal framework, and they have a, a, a main difference because they are not detention centers. They are not detention centers. They are, uh, they are centers uh, for emergency re reception and with a permanent ex structural system. The first was open in Chiclana and now uh, there are not two centers. There are seven centers in Spain. They have the capacity to accommodate around um, 100 uh, 5,000 people, so, so sorry, 1,500 people, and are uh, predominantly humanitarian profile rather than security and law, law enforcement criteria. Uh, so mm, these these centers are also uh, they are run by NGOs, primarily, but but by the Red Cross. Uh, this outsourcing management to the third sector the third sector raises problems on transparency regarding admission protocols, a care provision and departure criteria, but they are not the, this, this is the main negative aspect of this, of this, uh, of this center. So um, transparency in the, structure, in the structure, management and operation of the CATES and CAETs is imperative. Consequently, regulations should be approved that include monitoring their compliance in daily operation. Uh, agreements with NGOs or private institutions should prioritize transparency regarding the mechanism of action and protection of people. Uh, moving to conclusion, uh, we, we have to say that the, the, the widespread implementation of CATES as an instrument for migration management reflects a substantial change in Spanish policy on irregular immigration by sea. According to the official figures, over half of the people arriving in Spain in 2008, uh, 2018 and 2019 arriving in Spain by sea were detained in Cates. Cates are the Spanish hotspots, hot despite there, are not a formal, there is not a formal declaration of the creation of these hotspots. 
well, this is one of the biggest failures of the CATES. They have not a legal framework that would enable monitoring of compliance with the stipulated conditions for the detention of these, uh, of these people. In fact, CATES are detention centers, but don't fulfill the requirements established in current legislation. In the first instance, it will be necessary to regulate uh, the care procedures, legal assistance mechanisms, length and condition of stay, and other elements necessary to enable this center to respect as far as possible the human rights of the detainees, and most especially of those in situations of vulnerability and extreme vulnerability. The restrained, situa the restrained situation has allowed to vulnerate limits so relevant as the maximum for detention linked to the COVID situation. In fact, the police justify the length of the detention because those migrants were in direct contact to a COVID positive case. However, it shows the incorrect understanding of the CAT institution by the Spanish authorities that didn't consider CATES as detention centers, although they are. The creation of these centers has enabled the Spanish government to generate two, differenti two differentiated management systems. One of these, one of these targets people from of Maghreb origin who are not usually to, taken to the CATES, but are instead instead detained at police station for subsequent transfer to the CS from where they are can be deported with great easy due to agreements between Spain and the respective countries of origin. The other target, the other targets people of sub-Saharan origin for whom the rate of internment is lower. Following detainment in the CATES, other new mechanisms are brought into play. The alternative to internment in a CIE proposed by the government for sub-Saharan migrants is reception in CAID. This has enabled the Sanchez government to improve the efficiency of the CIEs and increase their, their repatriation rates with a reduction in sub-Saharan internees and an increase in those from the Maghreb. In short, the CATES represent a new element in migration management that facilitates deportation. Their creation evidences significant, significant deficiencies, such as unsatisfactory condition and the lack of a regulatory framework of protocols. However, the goal was not create a better system, but rather one that facilitated discriminatory deportation of Maghreb over sub-Saharan migrants. And this has been successfully achieved through the CATES. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Diego and Devika. Um, I, I don't know if my sign came, uh, was mirrored in the wrong way, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, at least you allowed me to uh, use it. So thank you for this very interesting paper. Um, I'm monitoring the chat to uh, put the questions on stack um, and we'll take all the questions after our next and last presenter. Uh, Cristina Fernández Besa, adelante. 20 minutes. Gracias, Sula. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Your accent is so good that I just automatically <laughs> answer in Spanish. Sorry. <laughs> well, um, good afternoon and good morning um, to those attending from the Americas. I want to start also by, like my colleagues, thanking and congratulating Ana Ballesteros for the difficult organization of this event, because it's a pleasure to participate in this international discussion, even if it's uh, being online, because I'm sure that uh, it's going to be uh, very fruitful as it, as it has started. Well, in, in recent, sorry. I have a problem because, ah, yes. In recent years, several international scholars from the perspective of criminal immigration or the criminology of mobility, and me included, uh, have called to consider, to consider immigration detention and deportation as an expansion and a transformation of criminological conceptions on penal power. And uh, today uh, I will share with you some of the findings of my research in this field based on the case study of Spain, um, which has been recently published in Spanish in uh, this book. Specifically, today's presentation is aimed at exploring the different roles and purposes of immigration detention and to show how do they perform in a specific context. By taking into consideration the transformation of the Spanish detention model, some of them that have been um, explained in my 
by my present colleagues, my presentation may contribute uh, to answer the main question of this conference or how immigration detention has eventually or not expanded the penal landscape in Spain. As my colleague Brenda Riz has just shown in his presentation, detention practices vary widely across national jurisdictions. Consequently, immigration detention cannot be grasped by theories built on either a single national case or a handful of national cases. To test this hypothesis, first I will present the main thesis analyzing the purposes of immigration detention practices, and then I will explore the fluid and contradictory, contradictory Spanish immigration detention landscape, drawing on both the theoretical framework and a variety of data, mainly from official sources. Finally, I will conclude by reflecting on how this national case may assist in enriching academic conversation on this field. Well, from a strictly legal viewpoint, uh, all of you know, the aim of immigration detention practices is clear. It is an immigration law instrument that serves to the purpose of border control system and specifically of deportation. Um, in fact, in many jurisdictions, it is an administrative law precautionary measure to be imposed for the preparation of the eventual enforcement of a removal or a return order. However, this legal definition do, does not exhaust the social, legal and criminological debate um, on the nature and mission of immigration detention practices. On the contrary, a number of influential theses have been elaborated to grasp the aims and functions, both instrumental and symbolic, actually pursued by these immigration enforcement policies. In this regard, one uh, important theory of recent years is the well-known immigration thesis. In summary, this, perspect this perspective asks that immigration law and criminal law have gradually converged to the point of leading to the construction of something new. The new immigration order led to a number of changes, one of which is the use of immigration law devices, such as immigration detention and deportation, to deal with criminal offenses perpetrated by non-citizens. Another one is the adoption of punitive criminal law-like law instruments and procedures in the field of immigration control, circumventing rights-based legal safeguards. The immigration thesis, therefore, um, concludes that immigration detention is being increasingly used for crime prevention purposes rather for its traditional mission related to immigration law breaches. As a consequence, one should expect to see significant contingents of non-citizens confined for crime reasons in administrative law detention facilities. Uh, spoiler, this is not the case of Spain. Uh, in contrast, other literature has scrutinized the purposes of immigration detention by giving prevalence to its auxiliary role to the deportation machine. In this framework, various scholars have highlighted the deterrence aspects of detention policies. Some authors have embraced what have, might be called the a general deterrence viewpoint in which detention practices are understood as aimed at dissuading in undocumented and unwanted non-citizen from coming, setting and staying in a given national community. From this perspective, detention strategies are just one piece on a complex assemblage of deterrent migration policies together with housing regulations, labor laws, social security provisions, etc. Then another body of literature adopts a sort of special deterrence lens in exploring migration detention purposes. 
in elaborating a peculiar manifestation of the principle of less eligibility, this scholarship claims that immigration enforcement practices are aimed at coercively persuading target, targeted non-citizens to leave by either collaborating in preparing their forced removals or signing in for the so-called voluntary return programs. Needless to say that this special deterrence aim uh, require detention conditions to be particularly harsh. Despite the efforts, the efforts invested in exploring these perspectives, there is a consistent consensus among scholars working in various national settings that border air penalty devices fail to serve deterrence purposes. Migration flows, therefore, seem to be largely unrelated to immigration enforcement strategies. Besides that, many scholars that refer to the self experience of detainees uh, imprisonment in detention centers consider immigration detention itself as a punishment. But considering the uh, and the portability deficit affecting various enforcement migration immigration system, there are many theses stressing the modest role played by immigration detention practices that discard any meaningful contribution of detention policies to the deportation apparatus. The Italian case is critical in this regard. In Italy, the detention state has been serving the purpose of management, uh, street level public order, facilitating police force to govern allegedly troublesome non-citizen uh, population because of their uh, undeportability rates. In this case, as in any other detention scenario, burdened by undeportability obstacles, immigration detention actually operate as a tool for policing, policing sorry, social dangerousness. In sum, the goals of detention measures are as variated as the immigration detention landscape itself. In spite of the alleged uh, harmonization of border control policies uh, across the European Union jurisdiction, these diverse perspectives su uh, suggest that the detention system continent wide is far from having a clear and precise mission, but it is serving various goals and following divergent paths. The coming section examines if and how the Spanish immigration detention system can be framed in this heterogeneous scenario. Well, according to the national regulation, immigration detention in Spain is an administrative supervision measure to ensure, ensure the eventual deportation of undocumented or convicted migrants. However, as my colleagues explained before, no more than the 50% of those detained were effectively deported. And as you can see in these pictures, it looks like a prison facility. To scrutinize the role of my immigration detention in the last years, I've analyzed uh, retros retrospectively the number of persons detained from immigration reasons until 2019, because what happened after the pandemic, as uh, Brandarit has explained, requires another type of analysis. As you, as you can see in the graph, between 2006 and 2019, the use of immigration detention decreases the 87%. The most important decline took place between 2006 and 2009, when the informal detention camps of the Canary Islands, which are in, as you know, as you can see here, in the Atlantic Oceans in the front of African coast, were closed. Then, despite the smile spikes in 2011 and 2017, the number of people in immigration detention downsized and until its stabilization in an average around 7,000 people per year. 
Next, I will try to explain this trend underlying the functions of immigration detention in the different periods. First, um, comparing the evolution of detention with the number of irregular arrivals to the Spanish southern borders, we realize that the follow that sorry that they follow the same evolution until 2015. This correlation changed in 2014 when the immigration detention continued stable, and but irregular entries started to rise until they top in 2018. The gap between the number of detainees and the number of irregular arrivals from 2017 to the present was fulfilled, but the new migrant detention center, so the so-called uh, so CATES, presented by my colleagues, uh, Delica Perez and Diego Goza. These new centers with these hotspot like, uh, hot like new centers, as they said, I aim to give a humanitarian reception to recent arrivals. But also, as my colleagues explained before, they are to identify migrants and to distinguish those who may be subject to repatriation, mainly Moroccan and Algerian, and those who are not, from, mainly from sub-Saharan countries. These new centers allow um, for avoiding the entry of non-deportable um, migrants to immigration detention from 2007 onwards, and therefore improving the efficiency of deportation of these uh, national, national foreigners. Consequently, as illegal entry or illegal stay in Spain are administrative offenses, but not crimes, mainly the population of immigration detention does not used to be related with any crime or recent years. The purpose of these facilities is related to the border management and it is aimed at shielding not only national, but also European uh, external border. However, according to the chart, the total number of detainees was about the double of the number of people who reached the southern border from 20, uh, 2008 to 2013. This means that many people were not arrested at the border. They were arrested for being undocumented, for having criminal records, or for pending criminal deportation that is the substitution of the informant of a prison sentence for a deportation. Usually, they were arrested for crime preventive purposes, sorry, but also as a way for policing social dangerousness. For instance, operation against prostitution or against habitual offenders ended with uh, the arrest of undocumented migrants and their detention in immigration facilities. Immigration detention because then a pre-immigration instrument free from many legal safeguards and procedures to work on citizen securities for the police to work on citizen securities and to prevent crime. This function of immigration detention implied the discriminatory expansion of penal power. Then, since 2015, the number of migrants arriving to Spain increased again and their profile changed. Refugee, refugees seeking asylum appear on the scene, modifying the public debate and forms of control. Migration enforcement linked to crime prevention ceased to be a priority as it was in the previous period. And this does not mean the end of crime migration, but the transformation of immigration detention roles towards, and uh, as it's it said by my colleagues, a way of humanitarian management of both people arrivals. 
Comparing the legal reasons of immigration detention with the reason for deportations carried out from 2015 to 2018, this complicated chart shows that deportation for illegal entry, which in 2015 accounted for the 20% of perpetrations, in 2018 represented the 54% the of these uh, deportations. It also shows that the number of this typology of deportation and force was slightly higher than the number of detentions for the same reasons. The increase, the increased efficiency, efficiency of this typology of deportation is a consequence of the mentioned new humanitarian management and discriminatory selectivity introduced by the hotspots like new centers or cutters. This data also shows that there is an important number of deportations enforced without a previous detention. This is because in recent times, immigration measures, specific, specifically the enforcement of criminal deportations, deportations for having criminal records, and also many administrative deportations for being undocumented, are carried out directly from prison and from police stations, getting rid of the controversial detention centers um, which now are focused on other functions or on other um, profiles, which are um, managing both people arrivals and serving the logistical needs of deportations. To conclude, the case, the case study of immigration detention in Spain shows that the theories about immigration detention elaborated in other geographical countries are very useful um, but also insufficient to capture its particularities. The functions of immigration detention are shaped according to the performance of bordering criminal policies and the political priorities of each context. That is why uh, they are heterogeneous, flexible, and dynamic. According to the case study, the main function of immigration detention in Spain was not to guarantee the deportation of all detainees, since many were not deported and an important number of those deported were not previously detained. So it, uh, it was not the main function of immigration detention. It neither was to deter the arrival of new migrants since Regardless of immigration enforcement, migrants continue to arrive to the southern um, border of Spain. Nowadays, police use immigration detention to discriminatory organize the deportation of those nationalities that could be effectively expelled and to a lesser extent to arrest migrants linked to criminality or better say perceived as dangerous. The predominance of a specific function of immigration detention is not the exclusive consequence of police action or the unilateral exercise of state, of state power. The greater or least lesser use of the different functions of immigration detention depends on multiscalar dynamics. Specifically, the role of the Spanish detention apparatus cannot be understood without taking into account the geographical, political, colonial history and economical circumstances of, his, of this concrete border, or an, as Alison Mons will say, and its islands, which is a determining factor of uh, Spanish immigration uh, policies of the country. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of the presenters uh, and especially also for sticking to the time uh, that made it a very easy uh, job for me. We have the three uh, great uh, presentations here that speak very well uh, to each other and we now have 15 minutes exactly for discussion. 
And I have here um, three questions uh, in queue. Uh, two of them are in the chat, so I'm going to read them. And then there is a question from David uh, Mofete. Um, the first question is from Julia Menick. Um, she says, thank you very much, Jose. Could you please elaborate further on how and if the increased in externalization practices in Northern Africa, the Sahara, et cetera, are relevant to your approach? And what would your research suggest regarding the death of asylum? I don't know if you want yeah, to go ahead and, and respond, Jose. Oh. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Julia. Um, I got impression that I, I got only a couple of minutes to address these questions, which are really big. Okay, but my, my main 